Anyway, let's, um, let's get into some time in God's Word. If you're a guest with us, my name's Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm the lead pastor and the teaching pastor, and we've got a bit of a teaching team, um, and so in the next few weeks, I'm going to be sharing the pulpit with some of those in our, on our teaching team, and we'll be working our way through the parables of Jesus. But today, we're going to round out the last of this mini-series we've been doing since Easter. So just real quickly, at Easter, we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrated all that was good about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we do that every week, but we tracked from there to what it means to be a witness of the resurrection. That was the next week after Easter. And then the last uh, two weeks and this week would be three weeks of looking at what it means to be a living witness of the resurrection. And and frankly, it, it, it just means that we would walk in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that our lives would begin over time to reflect the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ in our own lives. And here's what I mean. In, in order for us to be a living witness of the resurrection of Jesus, as we follow his way of living, as we follow his way of following his father, Jesus is not only 100% God, but 100% man. And he really demonstrated for us what it looks like to live here um, on the earth in full submission to God and in full exercise and experience of the Spirit's work in his life. That's what we're looking for. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because as we grow in Christ-likeness, as his image over time is being perfected in us, people begin to look at us and, and, and see a resemblance of the risen Savior, and the gospel we preach becomes more, more, more reasonable, more plausible for them because they begin to see the image of the risen Savior in us. And that's the beauty of what we've been talking about the last few weeks. So then we've talked about the way that Jesus lived, and and we've unpacked that so that we could lay hold on those things and, and, and even ask God to fill us with belief for those things and even to fill us with passion to pursue those things. The first was that Jesus walked in full assurance of God's love. He experienced that, walked in the freedom that comes with that. We can too. You'll go back just a couple of weeks to listen to that one. And then last week was that Jesus walked in full obedience to God's word. We can do that too. We follow the, 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 the way that Jesus did that. And we learned that it actually wasn't just sheer willpower, but it was actually belief in the goodness of God, belief uh, in the trustworthiness of God that leads us to a place of gratitude where we willingly obey, where, where God begins to work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, both to desire and the ability to do what pleases him. Remember that? That's, what, that's how Jesus lived. That's the pattern he set for us, and it comes through the good news of what he accomplished for us. And then the third way is what we're looking at today. Jesus walked in full dependence upon the Holy Spirit. This is also something that I think is a pattern that Jesus set for us, but not something he leaves for us to do on our own. In other words, he doesn't just say, here's what you need to do, now just go do it. It's, it's, it's along the lines of every other message we've been preaching, which is that in order to really be fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit, there are some things we have to believe. And it's that belief that leads us to a place of, of behavioral change. It's a, it's a belief, an underlying worldview that comes through the shaping of the Holy Spirit in our lives that really leads us to a place of things like generosity and hospitality and, and service and, and prayer and worship and, and all the things we would want to see in our lives where the Spirit is drawing us into full dependence upon Him. It's not going to happen just by hearing a sermon and then determining that from now on I will be filled with the Spirit. It's, it's more of a, of, of, a, of a change in our hearts that produces a desire for that where we plead with God to fill us with his spirit and, and to produce all that fruit in us that only he can produce. Now, there, there are examples of this in the scriptures. And I think if you were to, to maybe find a commentary on the life of Christ or maybe just Google search Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit, you would find a long list of verses and really just a, a long uh, list of ways that Jesus uh, interacted with the Holy Spirit as far as even, uh, you know, as early as his birth where he, he uh, was, you know, conceived by Mary through the Holy Spirit and then all the way through his life you find him being led by the Spirit and even there at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus he was raised again by the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I guess what I'm saying is from, from before birth until even after death, we find the Holy Spirit at work in and through Jesus in every way. And this is, is um, something that we could probably do a several week study on. But for just the sake of the message today, I just want to show you a couple of verses that show that this was the way Jesus lived and that the apostles understood that this was the way we should live in full dependence upon God's Spirit. So just first look at Matthew 12, 17 to 21. This is, this is just a statement in Matthew about Jesus and him being filled with the Spirit. It says, This fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah concerning him. Look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious, and his name will be the hope of all the world. This passage um, starts with saying, this fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah's prophecy would, was that the, the Messiah would come, the servant that God had chosen, the one whom God loves and the one who pleases God, that the Holy Spirit would be put in him, that the Holy Spirit would be upon him in, in a special way, and that he would proclaim justice to the nations. Now, justice to the nations is, uh, is, is just as tangible as it is intangible. The fact that it says here, this fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah concerning him is referring to the healing and the work that Jesus did in tangible ways to bring about the kingdom of God and the justice of God around him. Tells us that this prophecy of, of justice and righteousness in the reign of our Lord Jesus is, has as much to do with a tangible transformation among, uh, among people as, as maybe an intangible one. I think it's, it's both. The reason I'm pointing that out is because sometimes it just, it just really gets under my skin, not in conversation with anyone, but just personally, the notion that we have thrown out um, what we've called a social gospel, and with throwing out the term social gospel, we've kind of thrown out any need for the church to do any tangible good. We just preach the gospel, and we just want people to get saved, and then from there, you know, we just hope they live a better life. And, and for me, that storyline just doesn't quite fit with what we find in the scriptures. The righteousness and justice of God is accomplished first and foremost by the saving of our souls, but that salvation works its way out into good works, works its way out into tangible effect in our own lives and in the lives of the people around us. And because of this tangible effect that Jesus was having, intangible and tangible, the scriptures teach here that it, pro it fulfilled the prophecy that this beloved one upon whom the Spirit lived would proclaim justice to the nations. Look at how the, how the apostles understood it. Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 10. It's another verse here, another, uh, another passage here where Peter's preaching. And, and, and there's, there's, I think, some clarity in terms of what the gospel is. And there's really only one phrase I want you to see, but I thought it was worth just reading a good portion of his sermon. He does it better than I could. So in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, it says, Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and who do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And you know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began pre preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. I would say with power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God, the Holy Spirit, was with him. And we are apostles, we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses." We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, and he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all the living and the dead. 
Here embedded in uh, Peter's sermon is what he understands to be the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, not only to proclaim the gospel, but for that gospel to have its tangible effect in Jesus' ministry. And Peter says, we are witnesses of all these things. When we look at what it means to be a living witness of the resurrection of Jesus, yes, we're filled with assurance of God's love. And yes, we're filled with obedience to God's word. I would say, yes, we are filled with his spirit to, be, to live in full dependence upon God's spirit so that we can not only proclaim the good news of Jesus, but so that in our lives and through our lives, a tangible effect begins to happen um, around us. We begin to, 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 to be a living witness. Our lives begin to witness to the fact that Jesus is alive. We can tell because he's evidently alive in us. So the spirit of Christ is with us. As we look at, at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, this is where Jesus is, is talking to the, to the disciples as he leaves and, and in his ascension and goes to heaven. So this is after the resurrection, a physical resurrection of the, of the body of Jesus, and then he has ascended into heaven. And just before that, he's talking with his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world, to the ends of the earth. What Jesus is teaching them is that they'll be witnesses once they've received the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now think about that for a second. Why isn't it good enough to simply have seen the risen Christ? Why didn't he say, look, you see that I'm risen. You've experienced the resurrection. Now go tell everybody about it. I mean, that seems like that would be all you need. It's enough evidence for a lifetime of dedication and service to God if we could just see that he were resurrected. And Jesus says, no, you have seen the resurrection, but I need you to wait for the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, and then you'll be my witnesses. I think what that tells me is that God's work really isn't dependent upon the ones he's working with. It's not really about how much you've seen. It's not about how much you know. It's about the Spirit of God working in and through all kinds of people. So that you might be saying, well, I have all these really special gifts and I'd like to use them from the Lord. And the Lord might be saying, it's not really about those. I gave those to you, yes, but those cannot be activated, you know, uh, just, you know, on, on the sheer, just sheer willpower or just your virtues or your abilities. They have to be activated by the Spirit of God. You have to submit. You have to listen. You have to follow. Or you might be someone on the other end just saying, I feel like I don't have any gifts. I don't have any abilities. I don't know what I'm good at. I don't know what I'm called to do. And I would say the same thing to you. It doesn't matter or just like with the person who might have some gifts and the person who feels like they don't. The truth is we all do have gifts. The Spirit gives each of us various gifts to be used to build up the body and to reach those around us who would need to hear the gospel. The truth is we all have them, but should you feel like maybe you don't, here's some good news for us. It doesn't matter that the apostles had seen the resurrection or what they knew about the life of Christ. Jesus says, wait, 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 and pray, pray, pray until the Holy Spirit comes. And then you'll be my witnesses. So where's the power? It's not in having or not having gifts or abilities. The power is in the Holy Spirit of God. So regardless of maybe what we think about ourselves, I think the prayer and posture of our heart is, Lord, you fill me with your spirit and lead me to do all that you're calling me to do. This is the beauty of the way that Christ lived. He was just in full submission and dependence upon the Holy Spirit of God. So that like we read last week, he's able to say, I do nothing apart from my Father. I only do what I see my Father doing, and I only do what I hear my Father saying to do. This is the posture of dependence upon God's Spirit. And it's a, it's a living reality for any one of us who would just surrender to him. The motive for surrendering, though, wouldn't be fear if, if we don't. Wouldn't be guilt because we haven't. Wouldn't be pride or self-righteousness because we feel like we have been. The motive is the joy we find in the good news of Jesus. Just his love. Just his willingness to sacrifice and serve us. His desire to, to be present in our own lives. 
The reason I say that is because when the Holy Spirit comes in and sort of floods our lives and we're filled with the Spirit, of course all these good things are produced in our lives, but he also kind of finds his way into those deep, dark corners too, places we might have been holding back from him. And I'm saying, no, let's be a people who embrace repentance and faith because we see the the good outcome ahead. We embrace what the Spirit is doing in our lives, filling us with His Spirit, because God's work really isn't dependent upon the ones He's working with. He works through us in the power of His Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is activating those things in our lives, so that even if you look at the disciples themselves who are following Jesus, you've got some fishermen, you've got a tax collector, you've got a zealot, you've got just all kinds of people with varying skills and, and skill sets and, and giftings, and God, through the Holy Spirit, is able to take 12 seemingly random guys. Of course, I, I think Jesus knew who they all were, but just in terms of the variety, 12 different kinds of people and turn the whole world upside down. What could he do with 200 adults? Not 200 adults with all these special talents and abilities. Just 200 people who would surrender to the Spirit of God and say, would you fill me? Would you make it clear what some of my next steps are? Would you help me to trust you? I want to follow you, and I'll listen. I love you. Thank you. If we prayed something like that, what could Hampton Roads look like in 20 years? I think we could turn the world upside down. As, as we study this even further, I think when, when we look at this, uh, dependence upon God really is a posture of the heart. It doesn't really describe our activity. The reason I say that is because we can be fully dependent upon God's spirit and be a hard worker. Being dependent upon God's spirit isn't um, a fatalist worldview. It isn't just saying, well, God's going to do whatever he wants to do. I'm just going to depend on God's spirit, and I pretty much don't do anything. It's not quite like that. It's not fatalist like that. There really is uh, the uh, the providence of God or the, the sovereignty of God working through man's responsibility to follow the Lord, to listen to the Lord. And so there's, there's, I think for us, we can be hard workers. We can be diligent in following the Lord and listening to the Lord and at the same time be fully dependent upon God's Spirit. And so for me, it really does describe a posture of the heart. Dependence really is resting in God and God's work on our behalf. It's resting in the things we talked about the last couple of weeks, resting in the full assurance of God's love. It's operating with a heart that that really refuses to be shaken by outward circumstances. And I think dependence upon God is working hard with all the energy that God supplies. That's in uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 29. If you have time to study that on your own, you should see the interplay there of Paul as he teaches what it looks like for him to be in ministry. He says, for this reason, I work so hard. I toil day and night with all of the energy that God supplies. This is, I think, what it looks like to be a hard worker, to be dedicated and diligent, but also dependent upon the, the energy that God supplies. And, and, uh, and I think it's, it's not, it's, I would say the energy that God supplies for me is in contrast with the energy that maybe other motives might supply. So the, the energy that greed supplies is not the way Paul says he operates. The, the energy w- that with, you know, with, with, with what lust supplies is not the way that he operates. The energy that comes from desiring recognition is not the energy that he's looking uh, to be supplied with. It, it, it's not these other motives that we might have. It really is the energy that God supplies that we're looking for here. And the reason I say that is it's motive and worldview that God's as interested in transforming as just simple outward behavior. He's looking to change us on the inside. I used uh, a couple of weeks ago when we, pre- when we talked a little bit about this, I used the ethnic preference and even the racism of Peter, the apostle. Just to, even after the resurrection, just to show that the Spirit of God is at work tra- transforming Peter's worldview and relationships with other people. Even those, I, I would say, particularly those who might be different than him or other than him. And I think it's important for us to realize that. 
that even among his 12 disciples and even after his resurrection and ascension, even after being given the Holy Spirit, these apostles still had a worldview, a, 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 a system of preferences and prejudices that still needed to be transformed over time. It wasn't like after the resurrection when Jesus commissioned the apostles that everything they needed to know they knew and every change that needed to occur occur had happened in their lives and that they were perfect for the rest of that time. What we find even in the apostles' life is that there's ongoing change and the nature of that change is within. As we we look, I want you to see this in Acts chapter 1 verse 6 and then we're going to skip to verse 8. Look at Acts 1 6 with me. It says, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and to restore our kingdom? There's still a little bit of misunderstanding here uh, as, as to the nature or the scope of the kingdom of God. There's still a paradigm here for the apostles they're operating in that needs to be exploded. It needs to be disrupted. It needs to be broadened. They're still saying, Are, aren't we the ones you love the most? Aren't we the ones that, that you have an ethnic preference for? Aren't we the special people? And aren't you coming to give us the kingdom? Are you going to do all this that you intend to do through us? And Jesus actually upends some of their thinking. This is for another time and another message. But I think when you skip to 1 verse 8, there's something significant here that sometimes we miss. When he says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, verse 8, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, it's in contrast to them saying, aren't you going to come restore the kingdom to only us? Aren't we going to be in a position of power? Aren't we going to be in a position of preference? And Jesus says, no, no, any... Any, anything special about you is that I intend to use you to bless all the nations. Not to grow in a sense of entitlement. Not to grow in a sense of expectation for all of the benefits you receive. But to bless you, to bless people everywhere. So I think he's upending some of their prejudices, upending some of even their theological notions about what God was up to this whole time. He says, uh, and that's where, that's the context for me as I see in Jerusalem and throughout Judea and Samaria and to the utter ends of the earth. I think Jesus is saying, no, the kingdom of God is for all people. And even, just quickly, I didn't intend to do this, but I've got to go back to Peter's message and when he's preaching, even as he's preaching, Peter seems to have grown in this understanding. Look at Acts chapter chapter 10, verse 34 again. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly. He could almost say, I now see very clearly, whereas he did not at one time. I now see very clearly that God shows no favoritism among the people groups of the world. Do you see that? In every nation, he accepts whom? Those who fear God him and do what is right. As we study this passage, I think what, what I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the disciples themselves were still stuck in a paradigm of ethnic preference, which was not the way God intended necessarily. His call on them was in a special way, but not so that they would see themselves as a special kind of people apart from what God intended to do with them, which was special, which was to be a blessing to other nations. That's exactly what God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I intend to bless you so that you will be a blessing to every other nation. Now, it was, I think, the Jews over time who began to see things in a, in a special way, a twisted way even. And, and as I study this, the reason I'm bringing that out is because it's just, it's just right there in the book of Acts as I'm studying it. And I'm realizing then that the work that God wants to do in our hearts isn't just to transform outward behavior. Like you're doing some bad things, start doing some good things. No, it's all driven by a worldview. And some of us are assuming that the worldview our parents handed to us or that we're finding from other sources besides God's word is a worldview that's perfectly acceptable and has no need of being challenged. I don't know any of you like that, but I I think it's fair, fair to at least assume that this is happening, at least around us. I want us to have a posture where we're actually saying, God, 
change me. I'm dependent upon you, not just to help me get stuff done, not just to change some outward behavior, but God, actually, I'm, I'm second-guessing some of the presuppositions I've had of my whole life. I'm coming to you, God, in full dependence to help shape my perspective. Help me see where maybe my perspective was broken. Help me see where maybe someone else's experience can, can shade or color my experience and my own perspective a little bit. I think what I'm finding in the life of the disciples is that Jesus tells them uh, to wait for the Holy Spirit and then they'll be witnesses. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because I think Jesus knew it would take the power and the ongoing working of the Holy Spirit over time to lead the disciples into all truth. Don't you think Jesus could have just said, here's all the truth you're ever going to need to know and then just make it stick? But it's just not the way he operates. It isn't the way he operated then, and it's not what he does with us. It's always, as I read it, there's this implied timeline. It's that over time we'll be changed by God's Spirit. Over time, God's Spirit will work in us to change more than just outward or external behavior, but to change our beliefs. Over time, we're beginning to realize that, that our worldview needs to be tweaked here and there. And it's this process of the Spirit working in us to reshape those beliefs and those belief patterns where the Spirit begins to produce fruit. It's then that we see a change in our behavior, then that we see a change in how we relate to other people. That would be the fruit of the Spirit working in our lives. And I think we need this kind of change in our lives this inward kind of change. Because if we look at what Satan tries to do in terms of working in this world, he's working through causing unbelief or putting barriers and obstruction to us taking steps of belief. He's working in a way as, as to teach us worldly wisdom or give us a, a worldly or broken perspective. In other words, he's not always just sort of saying, hey, you're angry, go kill him. Most of us would be like, that was a weird thought. I'm going to go see somebody. Right? He's not just saying, hey, go tangibly act on all your desires. In some cases he is. But in most cases, he's always speaking to our, to our heads, to our hearts, really trying to obstruct belief, really trying to draw us into unbelief, really trying to change our perspective or at least infiltrate some of our worldview with faulty thinking and a worldly wisdom. He's bringing division and discord so that you might say, I hope I never see that person again. And the spirit of Jesus says, hey, remember when I said when you're angry towards someone like that? That's murder too. And the spirit over time is beginning to shape our perspective and go, well, it looks like there's some more room to grow. And we begin in surrender to him because we believe he's good, because we live in the first message we talked about, full assurance of God's love. We say, God, thank you for showing that to me. You've revealed these things to me. You've given me insight into this faulty way of thinking. God, I want to change it. I'm, I'm embracing this change in my life because I know how deeply you love me. And so our hearts turn from resentment for him actually pointing something out to deep gratitude to him for pointing something out like that. That's how our hearts are changed over time. My point here is that I think Satan's always working to shape broken or sinful perspectives and beliefs. And that's why when we look at the Spirit's work, what we find him doing in the New Testament is working to renew our what? Behavior? Well, in a way, yes, but it's always secondary. Working to renew our minds. Have you seen that before? So many passages, and, and I guess I don't have time to cover all of these passages, but it's growth in these areas of perspective and belief that comes with dependence upon the Spirit. It's depending upon the Spirit to help shape how I'm believing and how I'm seeing things. This principle has taught me personally to always stop and check my first impulse. To always stop before I give a knee-jerk reaction to something and just say, wait a second, Lord, what are you doing? How would you help me to see that? Is there anything in the scriptures that help me to understand what's happening here in real time? Because I guess I'm, I'm learning that, that dependence upon God really is a change in those inward belief patterns, a change in that paradigm. And a lack of dependence upon God would be to maintain an old way of thinking inherited by someone other than God or God's word. 
a broken or sinful way of thinking about race, uh, a broken or sinful way of thinking about business ethics, uh, maybe a distorted view of what marriage really is or what relationships, how relationships are supposed to function. And the gospel actually renews all of that. It gives us, uh, uh, it, it heals that broken perspective. It awakens belief in us so that our lives really do begin to change, but from the inside out. I think all of these are examples of, of how the, 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 that God's spirit renews our minds, renews our thinking as we're dependent upon him. The reason I'm saying all this is because when we talk about dependence upon the spirit, for me, too many times, dependence upon the Holy Spirit just looks like him helping me get my to-do list done for the week. That's pretty much what it means. I know what needs to happen this week. I've got a, set of, a schedule with a set of meetings, and I've got a, a little bit of a deadline, which is usually Sunday at 10 o'clock. There are some things that have to get done by then. And dependence upon the Spirit isn't just looking at my to-do list and saying, God, will you help me get all these things done? When we look at what dependence upon the Holy Spirit is, uh, what we're, what we're, it's less about God lining things up for me to have a good week. And it's more about having our, our minds and our hearts line up with his way of thinking and his disposition towards people. Dependence upon the Holy Spirit is as much a request for him to shape our thinking as anything else. Look at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform your behavior and customs. Well, yes, but no. Look at how it happens. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God change you. Let him transform your behavior and customs into a new person by changing the way you think. Do you see that? This is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The gospel, the good news about Jesus is the only thing that can change the way we think. A lasting change, a long-term change. It's the only help we can find to renew our way of thinking, to renew our minds. And we're not just talking about simply uh, just changing um, some of our thoughts. We're talking about a transformed worldview. We're talking about a completely different way of operating, a different or a new way of relating to brothers and sisters. Some help for me was found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5. This is maybe one of my favorite verses that talks about the change that takes place in my mind and the battle against sin in my own life. It's here, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5. This has helped me to move from a reactionary posture to, to sin, meaning whenever there's sin, then I react to it. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Oh, I better stop doing that. And, and, and more to a proactive pursuit of fending off sin and running from sin, fleeing from sin. This verse really helped, helps me to do that. We are human, he says, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. We use God's mighty weapons to knock down the strongholds of what? human reasoning, a human way of thinking, so that we can destroy false arguments, false ways of thinking. How do we do that? We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture those rebellious thoughts and we teach them to obey Christ. You're not in sin just because you had a rebellious thought. It's when you take steps forward in following that rebellious thought line. In other words, when you have those thoughts that might be temptation to sin, here, Paul's teaching the Corinthians, take that thought captive. Take every thought captive. Take all of them. Take all of your social perspectives captive. Take all of your political perspectives captive. Take all of your theological beliefs captive. Bring them all captive and then evaluate each one of them. Is this in line with the gospel? This is going to take you a lifetime to do this. I'm committed to it. I'm hoping that as Anchor Church, we're a family, we would be committed together to doing this. Take every single thought captive to obey Christ. Is this in obedience with the good news we've learned from Jesus? It's not. 
Well, we're going to have to abandon it. Or it is. Let's embrace it. This is what he's teaching us. And I've, I think as I'm studying what it means to be in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, I've discovered that there's, there's more work for God to do in me than the work that I can do for him. And that's sobering. This is, this is I think, where we get back to Acts chapter 1 where Jesus tell his, tells his disciples, I'm not so interested in everything you know or everything that you can do. I need you to wait and pray. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to fill you with his power. And then you're going to be my witnesses. So for me, as I'm asking, well, then what do I do? Jesus has resurrected from the grave and, and, and now he's called us to be his witnesses. Now what do I do? Where do I go from here? Well, I live in full assurance of God's love. I live in full obedience to, to God's word. And I live in full dependence upon God's spirit. I wait. Just like Jesus told his 12 disciples, anchored church family, we will wait and we will pray. And in the waiting and praying, we see the disciples actively working. They're, they're appointing someone to replace Judas. There's, uh, there's the work um, that they're doing you know, in the city to proclaim the gospel. I mean, all kinds of stuff is actually happening in the church, but there's a posture of waiting and praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's where I think it begins, and that's what I think some of the next steps are for us. So we talk about following God and, and full dependence upon him. I think being dependent upon the, the, the Holy Spirit is not quite like making a call to customer service for help with the items we bought that just aren't quite working out the way we expected. <clears throat> when we think of waiting and prayer, for me, my prayer life really does, <laughs> the reason I say it that way is sometimes my prayer life, as I look back, I kind of jokingly make fun of some of, some of, some of you know, the extended periods of time where my prayer just looks like multiple phone calls to customer service. It's not, it's not the product I ordered. <laughs> it's not what I thought I was getting into. Uh, will you exchange it for something better? It's not the product I, 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 it's just all different. I'd like for you to fix it. Can you just fix it? Can I get a refund? Can I get some help? And I think what I'm learning in dependence upon God is it really isn't sort of, God, you help me get all my things done. Dependence upon God is tell me what things you need and what things you want me to do. And God created me a posture of submission. Like we sang just the last song of that first set. God, I surrender all. I'm giving up all my dreams and ambitions. I'm giving up all my hopes and plans. I'm giving them up and I'm trusting them to you so that, so that I still have these things in my heart, but I'm gonna actually trust you to work them out. I'm gonna lean on you to help me understand all of these things. And God, in the process, would you help to change me from the inside out? So dependence upon the Holy Spirit really is understanding that there's work to be done in us as much as work God wants to do through us. And dependence upon the Holy Spirit is for both of those, for the work that God wants to do through us, but also for the work he wants to do in us. Let's take that posture, church. Why wouldn't we want this? Why wouldn't we pray earnestly for that kind of power and presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives? Why wouldn't we want to be unified as a church in these things? I mean, frankly, there are 5,000 churches in Hampton Roads. We, you can sit on any one of those pews. Why are we here? Well, let's find that together. Let's pursue what God would have for us together as a church. Let's be united in our prayer. And our prayer is this. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let's join hearts and hands as we pray, God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. I think that's the only way we're actually going to see Hampton Roads upside down in 20 years. And if anyone has a shot at a global ministry, it's the church, not Anchor, but the church in Hampton Roads. Because, I mean, what we found in just five years of ministry is we have arms that reach all around the world now because of the military. We really could be agents of reconciliation, a global work of God just right where we are in our neighborhoods. If each of us would do and live in the way that Jesus instructed through the power that Jesus gives, full assurance of his love, full obedience to what God says, full dependence upon his Holy Spirit. 
We're not going to do that alone. We're going to need each other. But I do think this is possible for us. I do think so. And I do think that it happens by being united. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, They all met together and were constantly united in prayer. For me, when I say you can't do this alone, I think that's what this passage teaches. They were all together and they were constantly united in prayer. Let's be united in this. Not united in worship style preferences. Not united in classroom breakdowns in terms of ages. Not united in sort of location for where the church meets. Not united in any of those other secondary preferences. United in this one prayer. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let's pray.